Well, again, thank you for uh, thank you for coming out. And the traffic is moving nicely along 128. If you're moving in that direction, so hello to everyone out in TV land, and and this afternoon, this afternoon I give you John Steinbeck, and I give you the Grapes of Wrath, and also we need to frame all of it, all of that 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 novel, that wonderful novel, well written, and we need to frame it around the, you know, the Great Depression. And the, and the Great Depression, and that one of the work programs of the Great Depression, you know, and I'm going to come back to it in a moment, it was the WPA, you know, the Works Progress Administration, which was the, the, well, the most highly subscribed program of all the New Deal work programs. And under the WPA, a, a subset of the WPA was the Federal Writers Project and the Federal Music Project, and the Federal Artist Project. And it'll be John Steinbeck who will find a job working for the WPA, you know, not you know, shoveling coal or, or, or shoveling cement and making sidewalks, but rather, you know, interviewing, interviewing the, the Okies, which was a negative term, by the way, you know, the Okies from Oklahoma. And from those interviews and, and from those photographs and so on and so forth, he, he drew the material for the Grapes of Wrath. And we'll talk about the, the theme of the book and the, the message of the book in, in a little bit. We need to talk, we need to talk a lot of it. We need to frame it. In the, in the Depression. And, and not only did the economy, you know, gang up on the world. I mean, the Depression was global, wasn't it? And also the, also the environment ganged up on those farmers in the Midwest and the Dust Bowl, the dust storms. And a wonderful, a, a wonderful video dealing with that is Ken Burns. It might be Rick, his brother. I'm not sure. I can never tell them apart. But it's either Ken or Rick Burns did a wonderful piece on the, on the Dust Bowl. And to be able to see it, and, and he describes it for us, and, we'll, and I'll share a little bit of that with you shortly. To be able to see it in those large, rolling, billowing clouds of dust coming at you, uh, you want to put, put a mask on. You want to blow your nose. I mean, you're there. You're there. And it's unrelenting. So a little bit about the... A little bit about the, the Great Depression, that 1932, 1932 was the very worst year of the Depression. 1932 was the year Roosevelt was elected, wasn't he? And for the first time, and absolutely crushing, you know, Herbert Hoover, you know, who was up for re-election. And, and, and Herbert Hoover, Herbert, Herbert Hoover was a good guy. I mean, he wasn't a bad guy, and, and people knew his name for the great relief work he had done with the flooding in the Midwest in the, in the mid-20s, the flooding of the Ohio, the Mississippi, and the Missouri. They also knew Herbert Hoover as being a superior organizer. Woodrow Wilson had placed Hoover in charge of the food relief program for all of Europe, and, and he did a splendid job. In fact, I mean, his German passport read... We fed our enemies, or our former enemies, that Hoover's passport read, in the German passport, you know, this man is not to be stopped anywhere, anytime by anyone. He's doing God's work. And so when Herbert Hoover was elected in 1928, I mean, he, I mean not, only was he, not only did he feed Al Smith, and, and he was burdened with his Catholicism. I don't want to get into that. I mean, that was a whole issue with, with the country in 1928. But here it is, 1932 the very worst year of the Depression. I mean, 1932, 1,600 more banks failed. In 1932, 12,000 people a day were being laid off. 1932, 20,000 more companies went belly up. And in 1932, you know, here we have Franklin Roosevelt, you know, nominated by the Democratic Party. And for many, who would ever want this job? I mean, the, 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 the situation was worse in 32 than it had been with the crash in 29. And, and, and Hoover, Hoover was beside himself. And, and, and Hoover had no solutions. He did not know what to do. I've tried everything. And he pushed the powers of the presidency in, in ways that had never been pushed before. I mean, Roosevelt, you know, the thing with Roosevelt, see, Hoover was a businessman. You know, and he knew we have to be careful with the spending. 
Roosevelt didn't know what kind of trouble he was getting into. He didn't know to know. And sometimes when you don't know to know, you know you're willing to try anything. And, 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 that's, and that's Franklin Roosevelt. Take something and try it. And if it works, fine. If it doesn't, let's rewrite it, rethink it, and redo it. That's Roosevelt. He did not know what to be afraid of, except you know where I'm going, don't you? Fear what is the only thing we have to fear? Thank yeah. you. Fear itself, right. That's FDR. And, and, F, and FDR talking about a, a new deal. And he didn't know what that meant. It sounded good. And his favorite speechwriter, Sam Rosenman from New York, who had worked for him when Roosevelt was governor, had slid it into his acceptance speech in Chicago in 1932. You know, and Roosevelt. You know, speaking to the delegates who are roaring for him, boy, he had a voice. Now, Roosevelt had a voice made for promises, that rich, vibrant, believable voice, a voice made for, pro for, for promises. Roosevelt paid house calls on the American people. For, he came into your, well, he came into your parlor, didn't he? Yes. Right? Now, my grandmother had a parlor. What I could never figure out is why the room was never used. I mean, it was the most well-kept room in the home, but nobody ever used it. I mean, it, it was uh, off limits for some reason that I've never been able to figure out. I mean, I know culturally, you know, but it was the, so that voice came into the parlor, maybe, or it came out on the stoop through an open window in August. When's the last time you heard that word? Stoop, piazza? Good words, huh? They've all disappeared. Or, or, or it came in around the kitchen table, you know, a voice made for promises, a fireside chat. And Roosevelt at that convention, telling the roaring delegates, and those words went, went out over the radio, across a suffering land, 1932, the worst year of the Depression, and this is Roosevelt with that great voice of his, that you have not failed. This Republican administration has failed you. I have your interests at heart, and if you gift me with your vote, if you gift me with your vote, I will mobilize the powers of the federal government in ways in which it has never been mobilized before. I promise you tonight, and I promise the nation, a new deal. And it was done. And then the press, of course, Governor Roosevelt, Governor Roosevelt, what do you mean by a new deal? Well, I'll tell you what I mean by a new deal. I mean, boop. He didn't know. He had no idea. But it was a great applause line. And that's why he went to Sam Roosevelt. And he said, Sam, you put that phrase in my, in my acceptance speech, lowercase. Everybody's asking me, new deal, new deal, new deal. Well, we know what it meant. It meant to put the American people back to work, didn't it? And, and, that, and that phrase surfaced almost. That phrase surfaced in, the, in that first inaugural, the Roosevelt acknowledging, I know why I've been elected. You know, that our greatest primary task is to put the American people to work. And we can solve this problem. This is a human problem. It is an economic problem. It's not unsolvable. With enough hope, confidence, and optimism. And I want to stop for a moment and, and restate those words. For, Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt, you know, whatever their relationship was or came to be and to the nation, they were Mr. and Mrs. New Deal, weren't they? And, and, and Eleanor and Franklin, hope, confidence, and optimism. It's hard to measure that. It's hard to quantify that. But it is the can-do attitude. It's the voice. It's that, the swinging of the shoulders. I know why I've been elected, to put the American people back to work. And he told his cabinet members and that, you know, send your missus. He always referred to wives as your missus, you know, except Frances Perkins, who was the first woman ever to serve in a cabinet as Secretary of Labor, which I think is interesting. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and Roosevelt had brought her down from, from New York, that she had worked for him, and Harry Hopkins and, and Sam Rosamond and so forth, that he told the cabinet that we're beginning to work today. You know, tell your missus to have a good time at the inaugurals. We're going to work today. That's, that's the bad news. The good news, you're going to get an extra day's pay. 
So we're going across the street after I'm sworn in, and Justice, and it wasn't, it wasn't Brandeis, the name just ran out of my head, that we will be sworn in as cabinet members now, today. It's time to get this country moving again. And part of that is that works progress administration. And also, I mean, the New Deal was everywhere. And, you know, for many, for many, for many, for many young men and women who, let's say, were of the age of 16 in 1932, I mean, Roosevelt is president through April of 1945, isn't he? And for many of these young men and women, that he had always been president. In fact, Franklin Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, was really one word, you know, since the inaugural in 1933 and, you know, 12 years later with, with his death in April of, 19, of 1945. We need to put the American people back to work. I'm coming back to the WPA in a moment. But the farmers need to be helped. You know, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Uh, um, big business never got over this that Roosevelt put the government in the business of providing electricity, the TVA, competing with private industry, you know, regulating the stock market, the holy of holies, for the very first time, to regulate the stock market with the Security and Exchange Commission. And you know who he put in, play, in charge Kennedy. of it? Hmm? Joe Kennedy. Joe Kennedy. He said he's the biggest bandit I know. <laughs> and, you know and I'm going to have the wolf ride herd on the wolves. All right? I mean, Joe Kennedy. And, and the... The, home, the, the homeowners lo lo loaner corporation to help keep people in their homes. And it goes on and on and on. The NRA, you know, putting gov the government in the business of supporting unions and, 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 and allowing big business to, to regulate itself and to, get, and to get grounded, to get the feet on the ground. This is a full court press. And if it doesn't work, we're going to rethink it, rewrite it, and, and start all over again. You know, that's FDR. And, and, and FDR, Franklin, well, depending on your politics, maybe the D stood for delirious, depending on your politics, the, and that the New Deal was really the Red Deal, the, the Red Deal, it's communist. And, and for many, Franklin Roosevelt was, and I know you remember this, well, I know you remember reading about it, and he was that man. Remember that, that man, that, that cripple, Franklin, delirious Roosevelt? And, and when Roosevelt recognized the Soviet Union in 1933 as the legitimate government of, of Russia, that clearly was evidence, you know, that he's a commie, you know, that he's a lefty, and he's going to destroy the country. Well, my grandmother believed that you know, that he was, he was going to destroy the country. Can I tell you a quick story? And I, I never got this story. I never understood it until, you know, many, many, many years later. Apparently, my grandmother, Margaret, and I remember her doing this. I mean, she raised myself and my brother for a number of years. And, uh, and she would, once a week or once a month, comb through her pocketbook and throw dimes away I mean, she would, she would, she would comb through the, and, 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 and throw dimes away. And the reason she threw dimes away is that Roosevelt was on the dime, you know, the March of Dimes in 1936. And somehow in her mind, if I throw enough dimes away, I'll take dimes out of circulation in Illinois. Now, I never figured that out, except I would see her combing through her pocketbook and throwing dimes away. Now I get it. Now, now, there's an interesting habit, isn't it? She was a little neurotic, just a little bit. But the only woman who ever allowed my brother and I to have ice cream for breakfast. And that was great. That was great. And when my father remarried, what a mistake. When that, that's, an edit, that's an editorial comment. When, I, when my dad remarried, that was the end of ice cream for breakfast. <laughs> All right, that was the end of that. And also, and also having, you know, I'm in kindergarten, you know, having Maxwell House coffee for breakfast. And, and with the, you know, just mixing it up with hot water. All that changed. So since then, I've been in treatment. <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay. I'm making a little bit of progress. So here is Roosevelt and, 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 and getting mail, and the mailbags by the score, you know, showing up. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
It's as if people knew Roosevelt. And, and many would say, certainly, you know, as they stood online, not online, but as they stood, you know, in, when Roosevelt died and watching that, you know, that caisson come down Pennsylvania Avenue, you know, that people would say to one another, you know, that I didn't know him, but he knew me, you know, helping, helping helping people, that not government as mother and father, but government to help. You know, the government, the last, the last source of, an, of employment, of, of medical help, you know, that we need to heal the country. And in 1936, you know, when FDR and Eleanor, I mean, this is such a victory for the New Deal, in 1936, Roosevelt ran for re-election, and the results even sucked the oxygen out of his lungs. And in 1936, Franklin Roosevelt won every state in the Union, except Maine and Vermont. Except, now, there were more cows than voters in Maine and Vermont, all right? And we know that, don't we? Where's my Vermont guy? Where did he go? Huh? He was sitting right over here last week, wasn't he, right? Oh, you're here? OK, all right. You're over there, all right. The, there are more cows than voters. You want to switch seats? <laughs> uh, he's got your seat. Yeah, that's okay. There's a seating. There's a seating plan here, and I haven't taken attendance yet. You're both absent because you're in the wrong seats. The the voters in New Hampshire were so embarrassed that their neighbors in Vermont, Maine, had not supported the New Deal that they put signs in all the roads leading out of New Hampshire, signs on the roads and the bridges leading out of New Hampshire into Maine and Vermont, and the signs read, you are now leaving the United States of America. <laughs> Is that great? I mean, talk about an endorsement, you know, of the New Deal. And this is an endorsement of Eleanor as, you know, as well. I mean, Mrs. Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, she, she raised the bar of, of being first. Nobody will ever climb over that bar. She was the first first lady, and no one, no one will get over that bar. I mean, she just, everything she did set a precedent, didn't they? She traveled over 200 days a year. Now, she wasn't much of a soccer mom. I mean, she just didn't get it. She, uh, her upbringing, she, she had no role models, Eleanor, you know, for what a mother does. Her mother died so young, and her dad as well. And her, and her grandmother raised her, and she was a very cold, icy woman. And there was no affection. And, and Eleanor, Eleanor grew up in a, a very unhappy young lady with low self-esteem. But all of that changed. You see, all of that changed for Eleanor when she went to finishing school in, in England. And she met Madame Souvestre, and that was transformational. And Madame Souvestre, Eleanor Roosevelt, stand up straight, look me in the eye. You're a beautiful woman, and you have a point of view, and share it. And stop biting your nails, Eleanor. I mean, she had them down red raw to the cuticle. And so her, her emotional recovery, Madame Souvestre. And, uh, and then she met Franklin Roosevelt. And, 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 and well, whatever. And, 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 <laughs> Before the polio, and and, I, and I've often, I've often believed that in in ways that are hard to measure, it's hard to valorize this, that that polio strengthened Roosevelt emotionally, and it made him realize, and this is true, this is always true, always true. Few things are always true, but this is always true, and it's true in this room, for some of us, some of you anyway, and the, and the, and the the truism is, bad things happen to good people, don't they? Now, you don't deserve it. You don't go looking for it. It found you. Bad things happen to good people. And Franklin Roosevelt understood that, and that strengthened him. And that's why he, you know, he said in that, in that acceptance speech, you have not failed. This Republican administration has failed you. Gift me with your vote. I'm the real deal. I'm the new deal. And... That happened four times in a row, didn't it? There were no constitutional amendments yet to prohibit more than, than two terms. And so, I mean, Eleanor, a good companion, 
She was, I mean, she, she never saw herself as a wife, wife, you know, companion, helpmate, politician. Uh, she met Earl Miller, a very important man in her life, and, and, and no, nothing untoward about it. Earl Miller, Earl Miller was the head of the, the Secret Service in Albany. In other words, he was in, a state police officer. And he taught Eleanor. He taught Eleanor how to swim, how to dive, how to play pool, how to play polka, how to drive a car, and how to shoot a firearm. I mean, he, if you will, you know, gave her these skills and this confidence that she never had. So Madame Suva Stray, you're a beautiful young woman with an opinion. And Earl Miller, this is how you fire. <laughs> Eleanor was never a good shot. <laughs> now, how do I know that? Because she would go down to the FBI shooting range, and, uh, and all the guys would step back. <laughs> no, they, they, they would. And, 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 and Herbert Hoover, you can find this online. Herbert Hoover, head of the FBI, is that right? Yeah, J. Edgar Hoover, I'm sorry, J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, sent a note to FDR. And he said, Mr. President, if there's one woman in this country who ought not have a pistol, it's your <laughs> wife. I can't make that up. And I get this from my agents, it's your wife. And, and that led to another conversation where Eleanor Roosevelt wanted no Secret Service protection. I want, to be, I want to be able to drive around Washington. She had her own car. She had a blue Pontiac. It was a convertible. I do not want, I would rather, I do not want to trade my, my privacy for security. And, and the Secret Service complained to, to, to Franklin Roosevelt about that. I mean, she's the first lady. She's not your average Joe or your average Eleanor. She can't be driving around Washington without any protection. And they had a sit down. Franklin and Eleanor had a sit down. And she agreed that I will carry a pistol <laughs> in my glove box. But she had the last laugh. It was never loaded. <laughs> but that was the concession that she made. I'll carry a pistol in my glove box and, and wave at anybody you know, who tries to kidnap me. So we're talking about a, a very public and, and, and different presidential couple. And that's when the press minded their own business as well, you know, they, in which you had the right to a private life and a, and a public life. And oftentimes, they didn't have to blend. And, and we know, as I said, you know, whatever their relationship was, it came to be. And, uh, and she had her friends. Roosevelt called them squaws. That's what he said. And Eleanor was with her squaws. And, uh, and he had his acquaintances, didn't he? 19, World War II, you know, World War II finally cleaned up all those lingering pockets of unemployment, textiles, particularly in, in shoes and so forth. I mean, the men, the men put on a uniform, 13, 14 men, some women, you know, put on a uniform and went off to, you know, fight the war, the good war, the last good war. And, uh, and Rosie the Riveter, hello, Rosie the Riveter, you know, went into the factories. And boy, that changed everything as well, didn't it? Now, I know after the war, you know, Rosie the Riveter became June Cleaver. And I know that, you know, vacuuming in high heels and, uh, you know, and, and making sure that Ward had his pipe, his paper, and his martini ready. But a, a pattern was broken. And, and that will continue to, to develop as we get, you know, into the 60s, won't it? So we have here a very special time. and a de and. And a frightening time. That generation of women and men, you know, who came of age in the 30s and the 40s. I mean, they came of age during the Depression and of World War II. And this was a very sober group. And I don't mean sober in that sense. You know, that they knew things could go wrong, you know, terribly wrong. And it's not my fault, but it swept me up, you know, in the undertow or in the tidal wave of, of the Depression and World War II. John Steinbeck, John Steinbeck, as I said at the outset, had, took a job with the Federal Writers Project, a subset of the WPA. And he lived in California. And, and, he, and he gathered his material for his signature novel. There are many, you know, The Grapes of Wrath. And I'll, I'll recommend, if, if you haven't had a chance to read that, again. I mean, we all read it in the third grade, didn't we? 
Well, maybe, the, maybe, maybe in your junior year of, 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 of high school. I mean, everybody reads The Grapes of Wrath. I hope they still do. As we said the last time we met, I mean, nobody reads, uh, nobody reads Harry Beecher Stowe anymore, or certainly Moby Dick. But I mean, The Grapes of Wrath stands as a period piece, and it stands also as a, the beautiful use of, of language and its descriptive power. And he wrote the book in 1939. In 1939, war came to Europe, didn't it? In 1939, the, the German invasion of Poland. And maybe that's something we might talk about come next fall in a, in a, part, in a three part series. And I'm, I already have it up and running. And uh, it's, it's called Prelude to War. It's a course I teach at UMass Boston. And well, I mean, it's really rich and deep and so full of texture. You can take it in so many different directions. That Let's, let me read a little bit to you. Let me read to you the opening of it, the opening of it. And where did I I'll put my glasses open? I think I did, yes. And just as he captures the land, the, the dust bowl. And the dust bowl was a result of overplanting and overplanting and overplanting. And then, you know, during World War II, World War I in particular, you know, the tractors and, and, and the mechanized planting and all, and, and it, it tore up, you know, earth that hadn't been disturbed for eons. And then, and then those, and then, the, like many things, cycles of rain, you know, re were replaced by cycles of drought, and the drought came, and it burned the land, it burned the crops, it burned out the very hearts and lives of futures of so many thousands of families living not just in Oklahoma, you know, but Texas and, and, and parts of Montana and so forth. And I mean, if you look at the maps, the, the Dust Bowl was an enormous circumference of land right in the very heart of the country. In fact, that wind picked up all the topsoil and blew it east to the point that and in, in parts of Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts, that at times the snow would have a reddish hue to it. It's the soil, the red soil. And, and, and captains at sea, you know, reported from time to time, from time to time to time, forgive me, depending on how, how long that wind blew, that clods of soil were dropping on the decks of merchant ships. And it, it, was, it was nature, nature ganging up on the, on the nation as well as a global economy. And Roosevelt, I'm going to put the American people back to work. You know, Frank, Franklin Roosevelt came to power five weeks before Adolf Hitler did. And, 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 and one of the programs of the National Socialists you know, was to put the German people back to work. And they built highways, the Autobahn, and rearmed. So putting people back to work, hope, confidence, and optimism. And in 1940, you know, in 1940, when Roosevelt was packing to go home, because two terms and you're out, you know, the leaders of the Democratic Party came to Franklin Roosevelt, and they asked him, will you, will you serve for a third term as president? And he said, absolutely not. I'm going home. Ellen and I are packing. In fact, I can still hear them humming. Happy days are here again. <laughs> Remember that? Da, 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 da. The campaign song in 1932. And Roosevelt, I'm going home. I'm tired. You know, and he was anchored to a wheelchair. I mean, Ken Burns has made the point that Franklin Roosevelt, not Lincoln, or not, not, not Lincoln or Washington, is the greatest president. Because he, the Depression and World War II, and he worked from a wheelchair, which was, he, not only was he debilitating, it was debilitating to work from a wheelchair. And he was exhausted. I'm going home. And the party came to him. And, and Roosevelt found a sense of responsibility. And war is coming. It's coming. It's already started in Europe. It started in, in Asia. And they asked Roosevelt, would you, ex they changed the question. Would you accept a third term? That's a different question, isn't it? He says, I told you, I'm not going to the convention. I told you that. We didn't ask you to go to the convention. Will you accept? a third term. War was coming. And Roosevelt, the old sailor, he knew it was coming. The wind was turning into the northeast from the storm direction. 
Those clouds were coming thick and dark right down on the deck. And those waves were those long rollers across the Atlantic and Pacific. And it's coming. And that wind is picking up and whipping those white caps off the top of those long rollers. It's coming. And there's no safe port here. I will accept a third term. Now we're going right to, right to the book. But I'm not going to the convention. Guess who we sent? Eleanor. And she said, I thought we were going home. <laughs> of course, she had that voice that she couldn't control all the time. And she sounded like a honking goose. When she got, when she got excited, her voice would trail off like that. And one of her coaches was a voice coach, Lewis Howe from New York, who told out Mrs. Mrs. Roosevelt, when you speak, get up, say what you have to say, and sit down. The more you talk, the more you become excitable. And the more excitable you become, you lose control of your voice. And, and, and Franklin Roosevelt asking Eleanor, darling, darling, love of my life, my precious, your name is engraved on my heart. I think of you every moment. He never said that. <laughs> he never said that. He never said that. Only in a Disney film did he say that. <laughs> and I think I may have said last week that, that hi all history, history is not a bedtime story, is it? I mean, it's not a bedtime story. And he asked Eleanor to go and to accept the nomination in his behalf, and she does, the first woman ever to speak before a national convention. And then, and, then, and by the way, when you're there, Eleanor, do a little arm twisting. I'd like to have Henry Wallace as my vice president. And so 40, and again in 44. In 39, Steinbeck publishes The Grapes of Wrath. And if you don't have time you know, to read the entire book, I mean, it's a read. I'm going to read a little bit to you in a moment. That throughout the book, what Steinbeck does is he pauses. And he gives us not chapters. He calls them interludes, in which he steps back and just talks about the Depression, you know, on Route 66, you know, what it was like to pull into a gas station, what it was like to try to get a spare part, you know, at a, um, at a repair shop, at, at a junkyard. It's a little interlude. It, it's, a, it's an interruption in the storyline. It's like me. Sometimes I, you, you'll hear me say this. I'm going to take a side trip, and I go somewhere else, but I come back. It's Route 66, the interludes. You know, and it, it just enriches the story. But let's... let's Let's go to Steinbeck and how he captures. You see, it's about family. What happened to this? Usually they're up here, right? I mean, you can kind of lean on it and see. I'll, I'll never be asked to give a commencement address because I cannot, I cannot stand still. You know, I like to move around. But I'd like to give a commencement address. It'd be a doozy. <laughs> just bear with me. I just, just so we can capture this. Now, he's, this, is, this is geography. He's describing the land. He's describing the sun. He's describing the heat, the dust bowl. The sun flared down on the growing corn day after day until a line of brown spread along the, the edge of each green bayonet, ear of corn, each green bayonet. The clouds appeared and went away, and in a while they did not try anymore. The weeds grew darker green to protect themselves, and they did not spread anymore. The surface of the earth crusted, a thin, hard crust, and as the sky became pale, so the earth became pale pink in the red country and white in the gray country. And then he goes on. A man walking lifted a thin layer as high as his waist, and a wagon lifted the dust as high as the fence, and the automobile boiled a cloud behind it. The dust was long in settling back again. The wind grew stronger and so forth. The dawn came, but no day. In the gray sky, a red sun appeared, a dim red circle that gave a little light, like dusk. And as that day advanced, the dust slipped back toward darkness, and the wind cried and whimpered. I like that, cried and whimpered you know, over the, over the fallen land. And the people came out of their houses and smelled the hot stinging air. 
and covered their noses from it. And the children came out of the houses, but they did not run or shout as it would have done after a rain. Men stood by the fences and looked in the ruined corn, drying fast now, only a little green showing through the film of dust. The women studied the men's faces, for they could, for <clears throat> the, men, the women studied the men's faces secretly, for the corn could go as long as something else remained. And the men sat still, thinking and figuring, you know, what are we going to do? And that's where Steinbeck picks it up, doesn't he? You know, that the, the land has been tractored. The land is owned by the, you know, by the banks, by the eastern banks. You see, the bad guys in this are capitalists. Steinbeck is a socialist. Steinbeck is, is a wannabe communist. And as the family, you know, gathers, you know, gathers their belongings and what to take and what to leave behind, they're being tracted off the land. And if one reads it, and if you read the book, and the tractors, the way they're presented, they're presented, it's a metaphor, obviously. They're presented like big, giant bugs, tractoring all the, all the farms down, breaking the land, tractoring their, 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 their dwellings down. And the men, are, men, are des, men, the men are described almost as if they're, they're, they're creatures. They, they have no distinguishing features. They have a leather helmet on and big glasses, you know, so to keep the dust out of their eyes. And it's almost like an alien invasion. And the homes are destroyed, and the people are fleeing. Not, ev not everyone left. And to go to California, you know, the land of milk and honey, you know, where there are jobs, picking peaches, picking apples, picking grapes, that there are, there are jobs. And a book I almost mentioned, I'm, I'm going to mention it now, uh, another book by Steinbeck, I, I've used this book also. It's shorter, so maybe it'll get read. It's called In Dubious Battle, and it deals with trying to organize apple pickers in, in, on the West Coast. I think it's Northern California. It might be Oregon. But uh, Steinbeck is a socialist. Steinbeck is a, is a commentator on the human condition. And these men and women, fa families, they're going as families. But the family structure is breaking down, and it will begin to break down and, and be repaired. They hope, hopefully repaired in California. And as these Okies move out along Highway 66, that before they move out, we meet, we, we meet the, the, it's the Jode family, isn't it? J-O-A-D. And we meet Tom Jode. And Tom Jode is just released from prison. Uh, he did four years for murder. And it was really self-defense, but things happen. And, and Joad is going to go back to the homestead. And when he arrives, of course, the family is packing. Uh, and, and, and they're piling up things in the yard to be burned. And we can't take everything with us. And, and our, our lives are with the land. Our lives are the trees that we've seen. And all of that is gone now. It's burned out, tractored out. And we need to go. We need to go to California because we've been reading the handbills and there are jobs in California. And as, as Pa Pa says, we'll be able to take these grapes and just smash them on our faces and all that sweet red juice, you know, will, 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 in, in our mouths, it'll be sweet. It'll be, the, it'll be the land of milk and honey. It's so biblical here. And, and, and just as the Hebrews, you know, cross the desert, to escape the, the Pharaoh to their promised land, that we will cross this burning desert in one night because we dare not stop. Is that, is that Steinbeck on the phone? I'll take the call. All right. Or maybe that's Tom Jode. No, that's the That's the alert. National alert. The, and we will cross the desert. And Tom, and Tom Jode, Tom Jode will, will, will meet up with a, an ex-minister, a former minister. Now, no one is ever a former minister. It's like saying I'm a former rabbi. I mean, you're never an ex-rabbi. You're never an ex-minister. You're never an ex-priest or, or, or teacher. I mean, you, you, you're, that's what you do. That's, that's what you do. That's your gene pool. That's your DNA. It's in you. And he meets Tom Casey. Tom Casey is part of the, part of the group that's going to travel as well. 
And Tom Casey, a, a former minister, and, and Tom Casey is a, he's a spiritual figure, and not, not Tom, it's Tom Joe, Jim Casey, and, and Steinbeck does this deliberately. JC, Jesus Christ, all right, that's deliberate, and that, that biblical reference, and he becomes their unannounced or unattended spiritual leader. And we have to gather. We need to slaughter the pork. We need to get food. We need to make the trip on this old jalopy. And, and Pa, you know, Pa Jode, who had been the titular head of the family, Pa Jode, see, the family is, is going to disintegrate here. The women, you know, will be the, uh, they will help to rebuild the family. The Pa Jode said, well, that's, that's women's work. And it will be, you know, Jim Casey. And it's a great line in the book. It's all work. It's not women's work. It's not men's work. It's all work. We're picking up. We're moving. You know, we are, the, we, are, we, we are the new Israelites. We are the new Hebrews. And we've got to get across that desert to the promised land of milk and honey, you know, where there is green and there are jobs and that we can start our life again. We need to get across that desert. Uh, Jim Casey will be, will be killed. Uh, he... he he, um, by the cops. He, see, Steinbeck has a thing about authority and cops, capitalism, bankers, the law, and that the law is, it is our law. It's a community. We work together here. And there's only good work. And men and women and children all do the good work. It's a, you know, we're moving as a new community here. And, and when, when Jim Casey is killed, that, 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 that's when Tom assumes the role of being the unordained spiritual leader of the family when they get to California. Ma Jode, Ma is the rock. Ma. Men don't call their mothers Ma anymore. I don't think so. I know I get, I've heard pushback on that. I'm not Ma. I'm Mom. I'm Mother. And I'm not she. You know, sometimes you hear that you know, from your children. Uh, and I always said, it's your mother. It's not she. Now, let's start that sentence again, fella. And I, you know, that's just me. You know, not being a bad guy, just it's not she. It's your mother. And let's start that sentence again. That's what I'll say. And, and they do. Marjo becomes the the mother figure, and she keeps that family together. And when they cross the desert, when they cross the desert, her mother dies in the car. It's an old dilapidated car. Mother dies crossing the desert. And Ma doesn't tell anybody that, that mother has died. We cannot stop. We cannot stop to inform the police. We cannot stop to have a proper burial, and, and Ma Jode holding her mother, who's deceased, as we cross this desert. We need to get across the desert as a family, and perhaps we can reestablish the family in California. And, and we know, don't we? And, and the way the cops, the, the California Highway Patrol, you know, intercepted these, and it looked as if we were being overrun by migrants, these kind of people, poor people, desperate people who will take our land, you know, who, you know, who will, they're coming here and they'll commit crimes, there'll be break-ins and so forth. We don't want them in our country. We don't want them in California. And boy, the California authorities were really angry with Steinbeck, you know, the way he depicted the border patrols. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Keep everybody out. They're thieves. They don't belong here. Uh, the, look how rough they look. Uh, they're, they, uh, they're not properly educated. Keep them out. They'll bring unions. They'll bring strife. Keep them out. And, the, and, and this is, the, and Steinbeck is describing what happened. You know, keep these people out. And they cross the desert. And they make it to California. But, you know, there's no land of milk and honey, is there? They're, 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 they're moved. They're shuttled around like cattle you know, from one work, work camp to another, to another, to keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. And when they meet in 
there's a group of them that gather in Wheat Patch. Wheat Patch. And there are many families that gather in Wheat Patch. And the families help each other out. It's communal, you know, that we share the, you know, we share the work. The children are all of our children, very much a kibbutz, you know, very much a kind of communal. The children are all our children, and we look out for each other, and we, and we look out for each other's children. And Steinbeck is, is calling for a more communal way of living. We need to work together, and we need to, we've been exploited by bankers, exploited by the Industrial Revolution, exploited by capitalists. We've been tracted off our land and we, in California. And now we're not welcomed in California either. And Ma keeping the family together as best she can. But at Weed Patch, they have an epiphany. I mean, everybody's working together. And they're going to have a dance. Now, the cops want them out. And this is where Jim Casey has his run in. That the cops want to in, get into the, I mean, it's open. People are invited in for the dance. And then the cops are going to come in and start trouble start a brawl. And when that happens, this, this will give us an opportunity to close the camp down because these people are dangerous, they're lawless, and all they do is flash knives, weapons in their fists. And Steinbeck's saying, no, no, look at this, look at, look at this. We're working together here. And it's the authorities that are trying to break it up. It's very much a, so it's written in 1939. And and Roosevelt had recognized the Soviet Union in 1933. And, what's, and, what's, and what Steinbeck is talking about here, it's, it's very socialistic. It's very communal living. And, and the, the false promise of communism. And he falls to that. I don't mean he falls into it, but you know, from each according to his ability. This is Marx. You know, from each according to his ability. You know, to each according to his needs. And we'll work together here. And the authorities are trying to break that, you know, that, that sense of bonding, men, women, and children. That is beyond family. We're all family. And, and with the death of, of, of Jim Casey, Tom Joad, he has to go into hiding as well. Tom Joad, that I am the new preacher man, and we need to stick together. That's the future. That's the future of this country, to work together. And a Rose of Sharon is the daughter, Rose of Sharon, and an old, you know, a bi biblical flower. Rose of Sharon is pregnant by Connie. Now, Connie has drifted off. You know, uh, Connie and Sharon talking about how, Rose, rather, how that's going to be so good in California, and we need to get rid of your, these, these old people, mm -hmm. and we need to strike out on our own. And, and Connie, Connie drifts away, and, and Rose is Rose is pregnant. And, and, and Rose, the baby is born, stillborn. And it's Uncle John. It's very biblical here. It's been raining for days and days and days at the end. Everything has been washed away. It's like the flood. Everything being washed away. And we can start again. And there's water and we can start again. The very, without new life, without life, we need water. And it's been raining and raining and raining, and everything is washed away. And the baby, which had been you know, a hope, a new life, a new birth, a new child in, a, in, a, in this new promised land. And, the false, and, and that birth is a, it's not a false birth. It's a deadly birth. It's, it's stillborn. And Uncle John takes the child, and he wraps it in swaddling clothes, and he places the child in a casket. But it's not a casket. It's a... It's an apple barrel, or, or it's a barrel, it's a box of apples. Apples, the Garden of Eden, if you will. I mean, you can take this in like a piece of taffy. You can stretch it any way you want to stretch it, and sometimes overstretch it. And he, just like Moses, going down the Nile, you know, he, he, he puts the dead child in that apple crate, and he talks to the child, send them a message, tell them, a, send them a message, send them a message. We're here, you know, we're here, and we're not going anywhere. And Rose of Sharon, and Mother doesn't ask her to do this, you know, but Mother looking at Rose, her daughter, and communicating through her eyes, and you know, they're, they're in a barn, and there's water everywhere, everywhere. And staggering into the barn, you know, comes a, 
an older man who's starving with his son, who's starving, and Rose is thick with milk, and, and, the, and the guy's obviously starving. And, and, and Mother looks at Rose, and the, the, the word is, without saying it, will you suckle him? Will you nourish him? Give life to him. The life you could not give to your child. Can you nourish this man? And, and she does. And he resists at first, you know, because she pulls him in and unbuttons her blouse and, and, and puts his mouth on her, on her nipple. And he resists at first. And then it's very moving. You know, he settles in, he's comforted, and he begins to draw life sustenance. And that notion of, of, of rebirth, of living, and so forth. Uh, and, and maybe there's a new start here. If, uh, and, and that's where the film, the film, by the way, Henry Fond is in the film, isn't it? You know, and it, I mean, it's an old film. It's an old black and white film. But if one can get through that, and, you, and one can do it in a film class, and because students know what they're looking at. Um, they've, been, they've been kind of coached up a little bit. I like to use film, not the whole film. You're not there to watch movies. But there's a clip. Uh, I just did a, um, a piece the other day on high, high Noon, Gary Cooper, as a metaphor on the Cold War, you know, and that he is by himself defending the town. And even his new bride has run. But at the end, she comes back, doesn't she? It's a great film. It's a great f 10 minutes, a metaphor on the Cold War. Gary Cooper is great. I mean, the, his face is great. And when he played Sergeant York, his face was great. And when Cooper played Lou Gehrig, and he gave that speech to the, um, when he said goodbye to the New York fans. And, and, and Cooper remembered, when he went overseas, I'm, again, I'm digressing a moment, when Cooper went overseas with the, with the USO, and, and, all, and the guys would want him, give that speech again. When you, the words, when, 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 when um, Lou Gehrig said goodbye. And that's what they wanted, that voice. That voice, Cooper had a great voice. And he had a great face for tension and passion. And they wanted him to play Rhett Butler in Gone with the Wind. He turned that down. He said, I can't play that role. It's too juiced up. I'm not that kind of man. You know, I'm a thoughtful man, a quiet man. And when I have something to say, I have something to say. I want to share something with them. <clears throat> and this is before they, you know, they board the, the jalopy and they're heading to California to cross the desert. Maybe we can start again in a new rich land in California where the fruit grows. We'll start over. And then the interlude here. And then Steinbeck thinking out loud. But you can't start. Only a baby can start. You and me, why, we're all that's been. The anger of a moment, the thousand pictures that's us, the land. This red land is us, and the flood years and the dust years and the drought years are us. We can't start again. The bitterness we sold to the junk man, that's one of the interludes. The bitterness we sold to the, to the junk man, he got it all right, but we still have it. And when the owner man told us to go, that's us. And when the tractor hit the house, that's us, until we're dead. To California or any place, everyone a drum major leading a parade of hurts marching with our bitterness, and someday the armies of bitterness will all be going in the, in the same way, and they'll all walk together, and there'll be a, dead, a dread terror from it. In other words, there'll be a revolution where we need to get to California and to regroup, straighten out our lines, and there will be a dread terror from us because we are the masses, and we are rising up, and together, see, this is the false promise, the God that failed communism, have you read that book, The God That Failed? And, 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 and Steinbeck, very much a, a socialist, you know, very much a lefty, that we can do this. We need to regroup, rethink, and reorganize. 
And to be, <clears throat> he never said this, I'm saying, we the people, we can do this. And the armies are marching, the grapes of anger, the grapes of wrath. You can't do this to us any longer. And one fine day, and one fine day, it'll be here, to the barricades, to the barricades, not for us, but for our children and for our children's children. And I mean, I mean the book is full of that sense of something ominous may happen. It's a good read. It's a thoughtful read. And the way he describes the junkyards, the way he describes the dances, the way he describes going into the filling station, the way he describes going into the candy store. And the kids only have a penny or so. And, and, and the, per the lady behind the counter here, take it, take it, take it, take it. Women save this novel. I mean, I mean, I mean women are the, are the core of this novel. And it's Jim Casey who says, it's all work. It's not women's work. You know, it's all work. And I'm reminded here, as I, as I begin to close down, that one of the most requested photos in the National Archives is that iconic photo of Dorothy Elaine, Margaret Mother. And you look at that, and I look at that, and I look at her face, her face. She doesn't even have to speak. Her face speaks. That's Gary Cooper. My face speaks. And you look at her face, you know, and those children huddled around her. And she has her blouse half open. And you look at that. And Dorothy and Lang, the migrant mother, the most requested photo from the National Archives. And Dorothy and Lang almost missed it. And she had passed a, a camp. And she was taking photographs. She was working for the government, photographing the New Deal, photographing the land photographing the faces of people. And she said, I almost missed it. And then I turned around, and there was the photo. And there's her sitting inside a tent with the flap open. And sometimes you stumble on things, don't you? Sometimes you just stumble into things. It's, um, you know, but you have to know it. And sometimes you don't know what you're looking for, and there it is. And, and that is the most iconic photo, in, in my view. Of the, um, of, the, of the Great Depression. You know, it's called serendipity. You know, you're looking for something here and you find it over there. You know, you have a, a serendipitous moment. Sometimes that's how you find your mate, right? I and mean, sometimes that's whatever. You just stumble on something. I wasn't looking for it, but it came. And you recognize it. I always tell my students, always pay attention. Sometimes life taps you very lightly on the shoulder, and you're apt to do that. Turn and look, because you never know. You know, you never know. Pay attention to that tap, because you never know. It can be transformational. Not transactional, but absolutely transformational. Be alive to the moment. Be alive to the opportunity. And here's Steinbeck. I have a job working for the Federal Writers Project. I want to write about the grief. I want to write about the land. I want to write about the exploitation. I want to write about family and, and motherhood. And Rose of Sharon is the blessed version. As Mary lost her child, Rose lost her child. And now I can help this very sick and dying man. I can help him with mother's milk. And that's, I mean, you can take the phrase mother's milk and you can take it anywhere you want, you know, in terms of nourishment, resurrection, rebirth, salvation, redemption. I'll leave you with that. Before I go, though, I'm sure maybe a question on FDR, Eleanor, Steinbeck. I mean, Steinbeck, he and Hemingway are excellent. I mean, I, we all have favorite writers, but I mean, I mean, Steinbeck wrote a lot of good stuff. Tortilla Flat, East of Eden, a lot of good stuff. And he captures the moment. He captures the moment in ways that Fitzgerald captured the 20s. I think I mentioned that. You read The Great Gatsby. And depending on your age, depending on your experiences, you take a different message home. Because it, it, it speaks to you in a different way, in a different age, in a different circumstance. The great Gatsby. And what made Gatsby great? The ability to wonder, to reach. Green, the green light at the end of Daisy's Dark. Dorothy, it's the Emerald City. With the scarecrow, the tin man, and the lion the green and what that green meant, the Emerald City. And that's a great metaphor for something going on in the country as well. So before I leave, a question, an observation.
anything, before I break out into song. <laughs> uh, anything? Yeah, there you go, there you go. So FDR in 40, and again in 44. And FDR had no business running in 44. But I'll tell you why he did. As a good Episcopalian, I'll tell you why he did. I asked, because I did my stuff on Roosevelt, FDR. I asked the Lord for enough breath, enough heartbeats, enough strength to see it through. I want to know that we've won our war. I want to know that we've won our war, that I, as commander in chief, asking so many of these men and women, you know, put their lives on the line. It didn't happen, did it? The Lord was out. The Lord wasn't listening. And that happens sometimes, too. You know, and, uh, and Roosevelt died in April. The Germans surrender in May. The Japanese in August or September. And Roosevelt would have liked this. See, in the major dailies, the Boston Globe being one of them, maybe the Herald, I'm not sure about that, but the major dailies around the country would list the war dead by alphabet. And Roosevelt would have appreciated this, that he was listed alphabetically. And above him, whatever the name might be, Captain PFC, and Roosevelt, uh, Delay, uh, uh, Roosevelt Delano Franklin, Death Day, alphabetized, Commander in Chief. He would have liked that, that touch I'm of the people, with the people, and for the people. And happy days are here again. We've won our war. That's FDR. He would have, he would have appreciated that. Um, my boys went off, and I went off, and I did my duty, you know, and I died at my post. I did not retreat. I did not fail. I did my duty. And I've asked hundreds of thousands of men and women to do their duty, and they have. They did not flinch, and I did not flinch. I'll see you later, okay? See you later. See you soon.